Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, attending this talk. And for those of you who were at the FITSA conference, um, I apologize that you have to hear it twice. Um, so uh, this talk is about um, a fascinating concept in tuberculosis that I think has gained a lot more traction in the last um, five to 10 years. Um, uh, and during the time that I've been working in tuberculosis, it's become a really sort of interesting and exciting uh, uh, part of TB research. So many of you, um, the video is not working. Oh, there we go. So I think for many of us uh, in our training, we were taught that TB exists in these two static, relatively static um, states. One is latent tuberculosis, which occurs um, after infection. Um, we all sort of have this general understanding that um, everyone who's infected with TB will eventually go into this latent state from which 5% of people will progress to rapid disease within a year or two. And then everyone else goes into this metabolically inactive latent state and um, remains at risk for disease reactivation throughout their life. And that overall about 10% of people who are infected with tuberculosis will have TB disease. That's um, the framework that at least I was taught um, in medical school. And we've now come to understand that the progression from infection to C to active disease is much more complex. Um, it's certainly not linear, it's a dynamic and it's a, a continuum. Um, and along this continuum is a very, very important state that I'm going to talk about at length today called subclinical TB. And what is it? Well, there are varying definitions uh, for what it is. And depending on the study, it's, it's defined more or less strictly. But the general idea is that there are people that have microbiologically evident TB, meaning if you test their sputum, they will be expert and are culture positive. And if you x-ray them, they'll have x-ray evidence of disease and even sometimes sub x-ray level of disease, which has been demonstrated in studies that have done PET scanning and followed people at high risk over time and showed that there are even lesions that are below the limit of detection of x-ray that then progress to active TB disease. And that there, there is a group of people that have microbiologically detectable TB or radiographically detectable TB, but have no overt symptoms. So the debate is around this idea that this no overt symptoms point, how, you know, do they really have no symptoms? Are they completely, completely well? Or do they just not have a cough? Or, you know, exactly how asymptomatic is subclinical TB? There's a lot of debate around that. But what I um, hope to talk to you about today is a try to um, define what this is and then convince you that it's an epidemiologically important category um, and um, a really important target for our active case finding and um, treatment um, uh, and that it's um, probably more important than we've realized in the past decade. Um, and so that's subclinical TB. And it, it, it occurs somewhere along the continuum between infection and disease. But it's probably even more complicated than that. So in a review that he published in 2018, Paul Drain proposed an, a, an alternative framework. So instead of the sort of linear progression from latency to active disease, he suggests that there are two additional important stops along the journey. And so in addition to subclinical TB, which I just defined for you as microbiological, microbiologic disease or radiographic disease without symptoms, he proposes another stop along the journey between infection and disease that he calls incipient TB. And incipient TB is almost more of a conceptual framework rather than an actual disease state because as of now, we can't really diagnose it or define it. But what it is, it's a group of people who are at really high risk to progress to TB disease in a short time period, potentially six months or a year. And why does this, and, and these are people who don't have evidence of TB disease on x-ray or on sputum testing. And so why is incipient TB important? 
Well, that would be an excellent target if we could identify incipient TB, it would be an excellent target for an intervention that would prevent progression to TB disease. So either a vaccine, um, not a vaccine to prevent TB infection, but a vaccine to prevent TB disease would be targeted at people potentially who had incipient TB or potentially a pill or a treatment uh, that could target people with incipient TB would be um, critical because not only would it prevent the morbidity and mortality of TB, but it would have a massive impact on transmission because this would prevent people from progressing to the stage of TB disease where they are infectious. So in his framework, in his model, um, Paul Drain suggests that people, you know, some people um, don't even progress to latency, that there's early el elimination of TB disease in a percentage of, of people, and that others progress very rapidly from early infection to primary TB disease. That's the, that's the, the red line shooting up at the beginning. <clears throat> and then everyone else goes into the sort of latency, and that um, within the progression from latency to active disease, the he suggests that the progression from latency to active disease, as you see, is 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 not linear and it can be cyclical that people may be coming in and out of symptomatic states. They may have periods of cough and symptoms and then regress back and then symptomatic again and come back. And it's unclear whether or not this is related to other potential viral super infections on top of TB, et cetera. Um, but it's a really dynamic state uh, between people being infected with TB and eventually presenting with what we think of as overt TB symptoms. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, incipient TB. As I mentioned, it's, 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 a, con it's a concept more than a, a state. It's this group of people that we would like to target um, it's a group of people who are at elevated risk of TB disease within six months or a year, <clears throat> who would be an excellent target for TB preventative therapy or TB vaccine if one were to become available, a, a secondary prevention TB vaccine. And so a, the WHO has identified this group as very um, important um, and uh, in their diagnostic priority list at They've, di they've identified a diagnostic for incipient TB as being uh, very important. And a lot of work has gone into the field. Um, you may ask, well, isn't that what you know, tuberculosis skin testing is supposed to do or what quantifuron testing is supposed to do? Well, the problem is that TSD and quantifuron are, are, are neither sensitive nor specific. Um, they don't identify everyone who's going to progress to active disease, and the vast majority of people who are TST or quantifuron positive will not go on to progress to active uh, TB disease. So they are not sufficiently targeted to allow sort of a mass treatment intervention. So the idea being, if we had a good test that could predict who would go on to develop TB disease, we could test those people and treat them, you know, with isoniazid preventive therapy or 3-HP and prevent progression of disease. And currently, um, there are too many people globally who are TST or IGRA positive, and it's not sufficiently predictive to allow for that type of mass treatment. And so um, this is a fascinating trial that attempted to address the specific issue. It's called the Cordis trial. It was conducted in, in the Western Cape and uh, by the um, SATV, the South African TB Vaccine Initiative at the University of Cape Town. And so they've done a lot of work in uh, a field called RNA transcriptomics. And so what they do is they look at gene expression patterns um, and they try and find gene expression fingerprints that seem to correlate with people who are going to go on to develop TB disease. And these are often inflammatory markers, many of them relating to cytokine pathways and especially interferon gamma um, and other inflammatory pathways that correlate with um, TB um, progression to TB disease. So at the time that they did this Cordis trial, they had a, a, uh, developed a, a, a signature that they called 
risk 11, but the specific signature doesn't matter too much. There are many such signatures in the literature by, developed by different groups. And for the most part, they all perform relatively similar. There's another one. So gene, the, re the reason it's called risk 11, it's because it's 11 gene signatures. There's another one that's been commercialized by Cepheid and that can run on the expert platform that's called the Sweeney 3. So that's a three gene signature. And then there are many others. And they all sort of perform equal the same. Um, and they have overlapping, um, they look at overlapping gene expression patterns. And so I'm, I'm using RISC-11 and Cordis trial as, as an example. Um, so in the Cordis trial, they used the RISC-11 signature and they looked at whether or not it was a predictor of TB incidence over time. And so in this figure, the blue line represents people who are who have a positive signature, who have this risk 11 signature that looks like it might predict future TB. And the red line are people who are risk 11 negative. And the, the bottom is the timeline. So it's incidence of TB over 15 months. And you can see that there is a statistically significant difference between people who are signature positive and those who are signature negative. So there is a higher rate of TB in those who are signature positive. Um, but the difference between the two groups starts to overlap at the nine month period. You see that the, the confidence intervals start to merge at nine months. And so what that means is that it is predictive of who will develop TB, but only over a short, a very short time period. Of, so it's really finding people who are imminently about to be infected with TB um, in the six month window. And so then the second part of the Cordis trial was to say, okay, if we can predict who is at high risk of developing TB, what if we give these people 3-HP, TB preventive therapy, um, could we prevent progression to active TB disease? Because ultimately that is the goal of finding a diagnostic for incipient TB is to prevent progression um, to clinical disease, to prevent the morbidity and mortality of TB and to prevent onward transmission. So they stratified people who are risk 11 positive and risk 11 signature negative. And they gave, um, in a placebo controlled trial, they gave half of them 3-HP, which is 12 weeks of rifapentine and iso of weekly isoniazid and rifapentine. And um, that was what the Cordis trial did. And on the next slide, I'll show you what the, the results of the trial were. But this one is just this figure is demonstrating the performance of the score. And I and really it shows the problem with a lot of these risks, uh, a lot of these RNA signatures. So on the figure on the left, you see um, five different groups of people. So the red dots are people who have, all the red ones are people who go on to develop TB stratified by whether or not they had um, TB at the time that they were enrolled in the study. So that's prevalent TB or in incident TB, they develop TB in the future. And then the blue dots are people who don't have TB, but stratified by whether or not they had symptoms of a, res of a respiratory infection. So you can see that if you had TB at the time that your score was tested um, and you were symptomatic, you were risk, I mean, everybody is up at the top there and it's a very low uh, range. You know, you can see that they're really clustered there. So these scores definitely are positive in people who have proven uh, symptomatic microbiological TB. However, if you have subclinical TB, meaning they tested you at entry into the study, but you didn't, and you had a positive sputum expert or culture, but you, um, did not report cough, fever, night sweats, or weight loss, then you'll see that the risk score doesn't perform as well. The scores are all over the place. They are mostly positive. So the, the, the mean or the median is, is high, but um, the specificity is poor. There are many people who will be risk 11 signature negative, but actually do have TB. And then if you look at incident tuberculosis, that's the third bar, um, the performance is slightly lower. Still, the median is above the score. So that most people who develop incident TB are risk 11 signature positive, but 
you know, the specificity is not perfect. There are quite a few people who are risk 11 signature negative. Then let's look at the blue dots. Um, you can see that, and this is really the main problem with these signatures is that they're, if you only look at how they perform in people who have TB and people who have compared to people who have no symptoms, they do fine. They can, they do, they can differentiate those two groups. But if you put in respiratory symptomatics, people presenting to a primary health clinic with cough, fever, night sweats, but who don't actually have TB, many of those people will also be signature positive because these signatures are not specific enough to TB. They really just represent inflammation and inflammatory responses to TB and or a viral infection. And so that we can't use them to discriminate at symptomatic people um, to discriminate between TB, viral illness, or other bacterial infection. And so that's what that fourth bar represents is that they, they don't really perform very well in respiratory symptomatics who don't have TB. Um, and another way of looking at that is a rock curve. And you can see on the rock curve, which is the, the figure on the, on the right, um, that again, if you look at the red, the red bar, the one that goes straight up and across, that's symptomatic people with TB, the risk score performs great as a diagnostic test. <clears throat> so when you have a rock curve, if you go perfectly up and across, that's 100%, it's almost as close as you can get to 100% sensitivity and specificity. And if you're a pure diagonal, it means <clears throat> um, not very good uh, sensitivity or specificity. And you can see in the blue and the sort of pink line that um, it's not as good when applied to people who have subclinical TB disease. And so that's that's just uh, how good is it to differentiate subclinical TB from active TB, both at baseline and over time. And so now we look at the question of whether or not it has an impact, whether or not 3HP, <clears throat> giving 3HP to people who are uh, risk 11 gene signature positive uh, made a difference. And unfortunately it didn't. So, um, the overall incidence of TB was quite low. Um, if we go back, they had 1,100 risk 11 positive people and they had 1,700 risk 11 negative. So in those 1,100 people, I think they had you know fewer than, I can't remember, I think it was about 11 cases of incident TB over 15 months and there was no um, effect um, of 3HP. So giving half, giving people 3HP did not alter um, the risk of incident TB developing. That's what the D, D graph shows us. So the two, the two groups are completely overlapping. On the right, they attempted to stratify it by adherence. So they looked at people who demonstrated good adherence to 3HP, who actually came in for the 12 weekly doses. I can't remember if it was directly observed therapy or not. Um, and there does seem to be a difference if you look at people who were uh, more strictly, who met the protocol defi definition of, of high adherence, um, they do seem to separate a bit. Um, and so that suggests that part of the problem may be adherence to 3HP, but overall the trial didn't show an impact. And so what I wanted to 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 demonstrate by focusing on the CORTIS trial is number one, uh, how important it is to find this target, um, this a diagnostic test for incipient TB, that that's really crucial. Number two, how hard it is because it's very difficult to differentiate TB from other, other you know, respiratory conditions um, when we look specifically for gene signature patterns or inflammatory pathways or other things, it's, it's very hard. Um, and three, even if we think we find one, uh, when an intervention has been attempted, um, like in this trial, it, 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 didn't, it didn't show an effect. Um, so this is, this is a, a, an important goal, but we're not there yet. Um, and so now I'm going to shift away from incipient TB um, and go on to subclinical TB. So to come back to the definition of subclinical TB, in case people are joining us late, subclinical TB is the state in which people have 
no symptoms of TB, but either have X-ray changes or microbiologically detectable TB in their sputum. And so why are we even talking about this? Is this important? Are there a lot of people or very few people with this disease state? And how would we even know? So the way that we know the burden of subclinical TB is because it's routinely um, evaluated in the setting of prevalence surveys. So every in, in many TB high burden countries like South Africa and others, uh, countries will undertake national prevalence surveys every five to 10 years to determine the burden of tuberculosis. And the way that a prevalence survey is done is they try to sample a representative proportion of the entire population. So obviously you can't test the entire population, but you sample a percentage of the population so you can extrapolate from that what the true prevalence of TB is. And um, to be in order to be tested for TB in a prevalence survey, the standard approach is that you either have symptoms of TB. So if you report cough, fever, night sweats, or weight loss, you will be asked to provide a sputum test for TB. And everyone who is approached to participate in the prevalence survey also undergoes a chest X-ray, everyone, whether or not they have symptoms. And if they have an abnormal chest X-ray, then they go on to have a sputum test for TB. And so that's largely how subclinical TB is identified um, in, in studies is through chest X-ray. Um, so in all these prevalence surveys that were conducted between 20, 2009 and I think this study's review ended somewhere around 2016 or 17. Um, and when they combined the results of all of these prevalence surveys, they found that 50% of people who had microbiologically detectable TB in a prevalence survey had no symptoms. Um, and so were only tested because they had an abnormal chest X-ray and then went on to have uh, TB. And so you can see that many of these, uh, this, the South African prevalence survey is not in here. There are many other countries, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia. So you might be wondering, well, does this apply to South Africa? Do we see the same in South Africa? Absolutely. So in the South African prevalence survey, um, which was conducted in 2017, 2018, again, um, in order to be tested for TB in this study, you had to either have symptoms or an abnormal chest X-ray. And 58%, so that's almost two thirds of people um, reported no, two thirds of people that had proven TB um, reported no symptoms of TB. So the only reason they were tested was because they had an abnormal chest X-ray. And so these, um, this, these prevalence survey results were subsequently published in the Lancet in 2022. So there's a, a lot of debate as to how truly subclinical is subclinical TB. Um, and if you push hard enough, you know, if you weigh people and measure their BMI and really probe about fatigue and lymph nodes and fever and night sweats and weight loss, are they truly, truly subclinical? Are they symptom unaware? Um, do they just not have cough, you know, or do we just do a piss poor job of, of asking people about their symptoms? Maybe, you know, symptom screening is just poorly, poorly done. Uh, you know, many people have done exit interview studies of clinic patients. And um, after they finish their clinic visit to ask them if, you know, they have fever, night sweats, weight loss, um, people who should be routinely screened for symptoms like people going to an HIV clinic and find, and you know many studies have found that the routine screening for TB symptoms is conducted poorly um, at least on a you know routine in routine healthcare but one would expect that in a prevalence survey or in a tr trial hopefully symptom screening is conducted better so it partly depends on how strict your definition of asymptomatic is so in the Zambian prevalence survey um when they defined absence of symptoms as just no cough, then 40% uh, of the TB cases, of the proven TB cases uh, had no cough. But if you 
define absence of symptoms as no cough, no fever, no night sweats, and no weight loss, then the number of truly subclinical TB diseases dropped significantly. Um, so it's only 12%. So obviously there's some difference, but the key thing, and this is something, I don't have a slide for it, but it's highlighted in the South African Prevalence Survey report. The key point is not, you know, do these people really have no symptoms? It's do these symptoms cause people to seek out health care? Are they, whatever they are feeling, is it bothersome enough that they are going to go to a clinic, stand in a queue, and get a, a test for TB and be evaluated? And the answer is no. So in the in the in the in the South African Prevalence Survey, they ask people who who do um, who participate. You know, do you have any symptoms? And in those who had TB, have you sought out? You know, um, have you gone to a doctor, a GP, or a clinic for your symptoms, for symptoms in the last six months. And the, the vast majority of people had not sought out health care um, at all. So whether or not these people truly are completely asymptomatic, the point is whatever they're feeling doesn't reach a threshold for them to seek out care. So then of course, the next question is, is it, is it infectious? Um, and in how would we even know? So again, we go back to prevalence surveys, which is where a lot of our information about um, subclinical TB comes from. And, and in this review, which was published, uh, which is not yet published, so it's a preprint in MedArchive, they looked at the prevalence surveys where that were tied to household case finding. So in these four prevalence surveys, which are via ACT 3 was in Vietnam. It's a clinical trial, not a prevalence survey. And then the other three were prevalence surveys um, in Bangladesh, Philippines, and Vietnam. What they did was in people who tested positive as part of the prevalence study, they then go to the household members and they do TST or IGRA testing of household members to determine the, uh, you know, the to to, and then they compare the purport, you know, how many people who had subclinical TB versus how many people who had active symptomatic TB appeared to have transmitted TB to their household members. Of course, we never know if those household members got TB from their, from the index case or from outside the household, but we're just comparing apples to apples. So if you compare people who had um, subclinical TB to those who had active TB, what proportion of them had appeared to had uh, transmitted to household members, and so um, overall, it looked like um, subclinical TB was as infectious. If you look at the the summary, it sort of crosses one, but a little bit more. So was equally infectious to um, clinical TB. So it doesn't really seem that subclinical TB is less infectious. Then after using that data, they modeled it and projected what proportion of overall TB transmission stems from subclinical TB. So this is modeling data. And they estimate that two thirds of transmission stems from subclinical TB. And the reason for that is because people exist in that state potentially for longer than they do in a clinical state, because once they feel unwell, they seek out uh, diagnosis and treatment. And once a person is on treatment, they rapidly become non-infectious, whereas people may remain in the subclinical TB state for months. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And so based on modeling studies, it looks like subclinical TB is actually much more important um, in terms of trans global TB transmission than clinical TB and a very important target uh, for intervention. So of course the next question is, well, how long do people remain in the subclinical TB state? Um, and, and again, how would we know, right? Because we don't know the people who have subclinical TB. Well, we actually do because there's literature from the pre-antibiotic era that describes, um, remember, we did not have good, you know, 
before drug antibiotic therapy for TB until the 60s, as I think when we had the four drug regimen. So the first drug for TB was strepto, um, was um, aminoglycosides, streptomycin, and then rifampicin, I believe, was in the 50s or 60s. So four drug therapy is a relatively recent phenomenon. And so there's lots of historic literature that it describes the natural history of TB, first of all. Secondly, even though we now really rely on uh, sputum diagnostics to diagnose TB, historically, there was a much larger focus on chest X-ray and much more population level screening. Um, I'll show you a slide about that in a second, about mass, mass screening with chest X-ray that was routinely done in many urban centers in Cape Town and North America and Europe um, in, in the last century. And so from these historical studies from the pre-antibiotic era, where people were diagnosed on the basis of chest X-ray, we actually have a pretty good idea of what the natural history is from the subclinical state uh, onward. And so in this um, study, uh, preprint study, they looked at, you know, they used sort of 20 or 30, both historic and contemporary studies, and tried to model what how long people stay in these states and what proportion of people move on from subclinical disease to actual disease to death or come back, revert. So there is actually quite a bit of reversion. If you remember that figure I showed you by Paul Drain, people come in and out of clinical states. So they may become clinically symptomatic and then revert back to a minimally symptomatic state. And so they, this, this group estimates that at five years, 25% per of people will progress from subclinical TB to disease. I found that surprising. I thought most people would progress. Um, so th this was a bit surprising to me. Um, and that others regress to a minimal disease state. And then 30% would never develop symptoms. Um, and then some people do progress to death um, if not treated along the, the path. And that the median duration of infectiousness is somewhere around a year um, between when people are infectious and actually present for care and are diagnosed and treated. So then the next question is, if we could, if we had the means to go out and x-ray everybody and diagnose everybody with subclinical TB and treat them all for TB, um, would it reduce TB incidence? Um, and so, yes, there's some evidence that it could decrease TB incidence, but the evidence is mixed and different trials in different settings have showed different results. So the most conclusive evidence that, um, that the treatment of subclinical TB can reduce incidence comes from the ACT-3 trial in Vietnam. Um, and this was a community-based cluster randomized trial that was conducted over three years and it was a massive undertaking. So 40,000 people in the intervention arm were screened for TB and underwent universal expert and chest X-ray. So this is you know, on the scale of a prevalence survey. I think 40 or 50,000 is about the number of people that were uh, tested in the South African prevalence survey. And what they did was they, um, uh, they went back every, year and retested and rescreened the intervention populations. And um, there was also treatment, there was also uh, TST or IGRA testing and treatment of latent TB as well in the ACT3 trial. And then they used different uh, measures to define incidence at year four. So they did another population screen to see what what the incidence of TB was at year four. They looked at case notification rates in, in the intervention uh, communities. And they also looked at the rate of TB in children because ch uh, you know, young children under the age of five have by definition recently acquired TB. Um, 
and therefore can be the rate of TB in that group uh, can be a marker for the actual incidence of TB in a community. And so they demonstrated using these different measures that there was a 60% drop in TB incidence by year four um, of this intervention. And they needed to screen 1,000 people with universal sputum testing and chest X-ray to prevent one case of TB. Um, the DETECT uh, TB trial in Zimbabwe, uh, which was also a community-based cluster randomized trial um, with systematic treatment, this was published back in 2010, demonstrated a 40% decline in culture-confirmed TB in the intervention arms. And then there's historic data from Alaska in the 1960s um, that also demonstrated that routine TB screening and treatment that included chest X-ray and preventative therapy and treatment of subclinical TB cases could result in significant declines in TB incidence. And so that, that, um, that figure at the bottom uh, is demonstrating TB incidence in Alaska, Greenland, Canada, um, they had, you know, historically some of the highest rates of TB ever seen in the world. Not even, you know, that's 200 per 10,000. So that's 2,000 per 100,000. Um, that's, you know, four times the rate of TB, inc uh, TB incidence in South Africa currently. Um, so historically, these are, are communities that had some of the highest TB prevalences ever seen. And routine testing of, of communities using x-ray and and TB preventive therapy and treatment of subclinical TB did seem to have a population effect. However, when these types of trials were done um, in other settings, they're not always successful. So in the Tabella study, which was 27,000 minors in South Africa who underwent um, universal testing, so everybody got a sputum culture and um, this was pre-expert, so 2014, and everybody got a chest X-ray. Those who were um, sputum positive were treated. And if they didn't have TB, everybody got IPT, whether or not, I don't think they even stratified by TST. I think everybody got IPT. And there was no effect on TB incidence after three years. And so maybe later on, if we have time, we can discuss why there was a difference and what could be some of the factors um, that influenced this. Um, it could be because of the amount of migration in and out of mining communities, uh, that this is not a stable population. It could be that a one-time intervention is not enough, that you require a sustained multi-year intervention like they had in uh, the Vietnamese trial. Um, and there may be other reasons why this worked. Um, it could also have to do with HIV testing and treatment. Uh, this was... Uh, this is a really nice paper um, that demonstrates the impact of chest X-ray screening on TB incidence in Cape Town through the 40, between the 40s and the 80s. Um, and it's a little difficult to interpret, but um, so we have to be careful about how we interpret this data, but the blue bars indicate the um, number of people, the percentage of the population screened by chest X-ray, and the, the dark blue line shows the TB notification rate. So in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, especially with you know, the avail more widespread availability of TB treatment, there was really a campaign in many um, cities in the world to systematically um, screen their populations for TB and get them on treatment. And so this was also in place in, in uh, central, in the CBD of Cape Town. And uh, as that you can see, really, as chest X-ray screening gets ramped up, TB incidence um, drops um, over two decades. And then there was a shift um, in WHO guidelines and just globally a shift away from chest radiography as a screening technique as smear microscopy became, the WHO sort of made a determination that mass chest X-ray screening was not feasible on a global scale. Uh, there was a 
lack of awareness about the importance of subclinical TB and a shift in terms of prioritization towards smear microscopy for screening of symptomatic populations. And so chest X-ray screening really got de-emphasized globally um, through the 70s, 80s, and, and, and subsequent decades. And you can see that the uh, chest X-ray screening uh, program essentially stops in Cape Town in the late 80s, and there's also a rise in TB incidence. Now, this um, the timing of the chest X-ray screening program also correlates with the forced removal of people um, to areas outside of central Cape Town. And so that could also be an explanation for the changes in TB incidence and that the population being screened was not the same over time. Um, so it is interesting and it does suggest that there's a di direct impact of chest X-ray screening uh, on TB incidents, um, even locally in South Africa. Jeremy, will you let me know if, if there's a question in the chat box that I should um, pause for? Or uh, if not, I can pick it up at the end. Yeah, sure, we can we can catch it at the end of the queue. Okay, so so just briefly, I'm really, I, I, I I did. I don't want this talk to be about diagnostics. I really wanted to focus on on the concepts and the ideas. Um, but so I'm not going to go into detail about these various diagnostics. But I just wanted to zoom through them in the last few minutes. And really, what we need is a sputum-free diagnostic method. So even though we can find some proportion of people with subclinical TB using chest X-ray. We then, you know, chest X-ray by itself is not sufficiently sensitive or specific to diagnose TB. It, it can only be used as a screening tool. If you see an abnormality, you then have to go on to sputum-based diagnostics. And, you know, many people can't produce, who are asymptomatic, can't produce sputum. And so probably even our estimates of subclinical TB are low because they're, they're based on people who are able to produce sputum after an abnormal chest X-ray. And so we really need sputum-free diagnostic methods. Um, I know we've talked about that already at length, that we need sputum-free diagnostic methods because children can produce sputum, people with advanced HIV and disseminated TB often are, are sputum scarce, but we also really need sputum-free diagnostic methods for this population um, that is preclinical, subclinical. And so there are different um, tools that are in the diagnostic pipeline. I think the ones that are most interesting are um they fall into two categories so there are triage tools that would so chest x-ray being a triage tool or a screening tool to define who needs additional sputum-based testing and so i think the most interesting triage tools are uh, digital chest x-ray with um you know automated ai based interpretation to allow for mass use and then there are some other ones like breath-based sputum testing, which I think are interesting. Um, and then I think, unfortunately, our, our blood-based biomarkers are not quite ready uh, for prime time. That, like the risk scores and the Sweeney's and the, those blood-based biomarkers for TB are not quite there yet. Um, so I think the things that are closer to being usable are the breath tests and the AI-based digital chest X-ray. And these are just triage tools. And then in terms of confirmatory testing um, for people who can't produce sputum, there's pretty good data uh, that tongue swabs, so tongue seems to perform better than the uh, buccal mucosa, than the mucosa of the cheek, um, the tongue swabs for X-ray, potentially spit for X-ray may also be a good test. Um, and then the other ones, LAM, et cetera, are more for advanced, uh, TB in, in advanced HIV populations. They don't really apply to subclinical disease. These are some of the um, breath-based breath -based tests um, that have been developed. Um, there's There are some that have already been uh, developed for the commercial market, and then there are others that are more research-based tools. Um, some of them are like a breathalyzer that you breathe into. Um, others are mask-based, where you then you breathe into a mask for some amount of time, and then there's a filter in that mask that then can uh, undergo um, molecular and culture-based testing for TB. 
And then the picture on the right is somebody doing a tongue swab. Um, you know, others have talked about this, I think even in, in the VITS ID lecture series that, so I won't really go into a lot of detail, but there's uh, digital chest X-ray screening holds a lot of promise for screening for TB. Um, so the major roadblocks in terms of using chest X-ray for mass screening are the availability of radiologists or doctors to interpret chest X-ray. There just aren't enough radiologists and doctors in the world to interpret all the X-rays that would need to be done if we wanted to use mass chest X-ray screening as a tool for 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 screening for digital uh, for subclinical TB. And so we need to rely on algorithms, computer-based algorithms. They can just tell us they don't need to be, they're not, these are not diagnostic. We wouldn't treat people on the basis of an x ray. It just needs to screen people and say, this person is high risk for TB and should go on for sputum testing. This person is low risk and does not um, need to go on for sputum testing. And um, there are many algorithms that are available. And consistently, they all outperform human radiologists, interestingly. And they seem to perform well in people with and without. Uh, HIV. And so really the question now is how do we implement these at scale? Um, and is it time for community-based testing? Um, the latest WHO guidelines on TB screening, uh, which were released in 2021, um, now recommend systematic screening for TB disease amongst the general population in areas with an estimated TB prevalence of 0.5% or higher. Um, and so systematic screening could in, can include, um, you know, chest X-ray screening. And um, just to make the point that that is exactly where our TB prevalence is currently in South Africa. TB incidence in the 2021 global, so the 2021 TB incidence was estimated to be um, 500 over 100,000, so 0.5% of the population. And so um, I think this is my last slide. Where should we look for subclinical TB? So one, of course we could look in the community and that's complicated because, you know, although the overall prevalence of TB or incidence of TB in South Africa is considered high 0.5%, there are higher and low risk pockets. And it's very hard to figure out exactly how to target chest X-ray screening in the community to find the highest risk populations. We do know that some, some groups are extremely high risk, like people who attend clinics, um, not just people with HIV who are going for HIV testing, but there are other populations who attend clinics. It's actually not a bad way to find household contacts, and it's more cost effective than going and doing household contact tracing. And it's also a, it also is a place where you can find people with prior TB who are another group who are very high risk for repeat incident TB. So in the targeted universal testing for TB trial, which was done in 30, um, 60,000 people across South Africa, there were 30 clinics, intervention clinics, and 30 control clinics. Um, and in, there were 30,000 people tested in the intervention clinics. And they tested anybody who had uh, HIV, prior history of TB, or a household TB contact for TB, everyone got sputum testing irrespective of whether or not they had symptoms. And they found that 6% of people in this group had a positive TB test. Um, and uh, the vast majority of them um, occurred in people who reported no symptoms of TB. And so we could begin looking for subclinical TB in our clinics by routinely testing high risk groups. And I believe that this is uh, being implemented as a pilot strategy in many districts across the country, specifically in people with HIV, where there will be some form of either annual or periodic testing for TB using experts, irrespective of the presence of symptoms. And, okay, and this is the last slide. How do we treat subclinical TB? The answer is we don't know. Um, so currently we treat them as we do uh, clinical TB, you know, with four, dr four drug therapy for two months and and two drugs for four months, um, but there's 
reason to believe that people with subclinical TB could be treated with fewer drugs for a shorter period. Uh, we know that to be true from other studies that have looked at minimal TB disease. So people who don't have cavitation, who don't have extensive radiographic changes, they do fine with four, four months of treatment. So one could assume that people with subclinical TB, TB disease and minimal chest X-ray evidence of disease could also benefit from shorter courses. The other question is how adherent are people with subclinical TB disease to, to TB therapy. Um, if anyone in the audience has taken TB drugs, I mean, I haven't personally, but I obviously from patients know that it's, it's not particularly well tolerated. It can be associated with many side effects. And um, to treat a person who has no symptoms and give them drugs that cause them to have side effects is, is a tricky thing. And we don't really know how good the adherence and completion rates are. So to the extent to which we could treat people with the clinical TB with shorter regimens uh, would be extremely beneficial. So I will stop there and take questions and comments. Great. Thanks so much, Rimke. Um, that's, again, a really, really important topic and a, and a nice overview of it. Um, I, I just There's a couple of questions which I, I think um, uh, on the chat there, some other people have been messaging me. I guess maybe to start, I mean, one of the one of the questions I had when I think of this literature is that it's almost defined subclinical TB by having an abnormal chest x-ray, as you rightly said, because that's kind of the entry point to look at it. But I mean, just the kind of the common sense definition of the you know, subclinical would imply that you probably have a lot of other people who have a normal-ish chest x-ray or totally normal chest x-ray, but are still um, culture positive potentially. I mean, do we have any sense of how big that group is? I mean, it's clearly going to not be a massive, but I mean, I know you mentioned earlier on that you said some are actually detectable just by PET, for example. Um, do we have any sense of that? Because that seems to be a kind of a weakness of the literature where for historical reasons, obviously, um, we probably undercounting a lot of subclinical TB2. Yeah, so there's an ongoing study in KZN um, that I believe is, I don't know if, if they use universal sputum testing or if chest x-ray is the entry point. Um, no, I think even in that mass study in KZN that um, they're using chest x-ray as the entry point. There are smaller studies that have done you know, universal sputum testing of people with HIV in clinics and so on and so forth and find high rates of TB. But I can't think of a mass study um, that has used universal sputum testing with and universal chest X-ray because the whole purpose of chest X-ray is as a triage tool to sort of reduce down the numbers of people that would require expensive uh, diagnostics. But I agree with you. There is some proportion of people who have normal chest X-rays that were that are also microbiologically diagnosed that we miss completely. And this is where I think a blood test oh, would be extremely useful um, as an alternative. But I agree with you, the, the numbers are probably even higher than what I'm suggesting today. Yeah, um, and to get some of the questions in the chat, um, there's a the, the question about why do you think the data from prevalence surveys regarding subclinical TB has been so slow to emerge? I mean, I, that kind of, why well, I guess just more generally, why has it been so slow to emerge? Because I mean, it was quite striking when you said that we've actually had some of this data for decades, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. Yeah, and it's almost like we forgot. I mean, if you go back and you read those historical papers, they had a very clear understanding that people could have X-ray evidence of TB microbiological evidence of TB and not be particularly symptomatic. I mean, this was a known thing. And I don't know that I knew that really in my training early on. I don't think I had an appreciation for how important that is. Um, I, I really do think we sort of collectively as a medical and research community forgot that knowledge along the way as there was a shift away from um, chest x-ray based diagnostics towards microscopy and a really you know a lot of it has to do with HIV epidemic and a, a need to to find the people at highest risk of dying from TB which were people with advanced HIV um, and and you know we sort of honed in on that population in our efforts to do uh, in our case finding efforts and then also concurrently this idea that we needed to find the most infectious people and treat them as a way of stemming the epidemic. And so that was where the shift towards sort of smear microscopy, that if we find the ones who are smear positive, we're going to find the infectious ones. And along the way, I think we just kind of forgot. 
does, I, it's not a very satisfying answer, but I don't have a better <laughs> explanation. Uh, yeah, Maybe people who've been in the field longer than me um, <laughs> can comment. You can blame them for not, not teaching us. <laughs> um, and then there's a, a question from uh, Tandi Kaminimiti asking, it was at the time when you were looking at the Western Cape data um, in, with the chest X-rays and how the decline and kind of chest X-rays saying, uh, and I'm not sure, uh, uh, you can unmute if you'd like Tandi as well. Um, I'm saying, are the two comparing the same things? The three were looking at treating subclinical disease. Where's Tibella treating latent TB? Uh, she stands to be critical. I don't know, Tandi, if you want to, if you want to add to that verbally, you're welcome to unmute. No, I, I think I know what oh, Tandi's okay. referring to. The focus of Tibella was, I mean, the the um, the stated focus of Tibella was to look at the impact of mass treatment, you know, with of latent TB, but. As part of that effort, they if you look in the methods, they did actually test everyone, symptomatic or not, using culture at baseline. So they also treated all the subclinical TB at baseline. So they did both. But again, at the time that their, their study was published, there wasn't so much of a focus on the impact of treating subclinical TB. So that, that if you look in their results and their discussion, that's not what they're focused on. But they did do it. Um, as part of the study, they, they tested everyone, they did universal testing using culture of everyone who was in, entered into the study and everyone who was positive got tested. And then in addition, they did IPT. Yeah, that's, yeah. thank you. That's a, that's a great point. Um, and then I guess just the last last point about and it's related right at the beginning, not directly to what you're saying, but this kind of confusion in the literature often between using IGRA or TST positivity as a marker of latent TB, you know, assuming, so you say you, IGRA positive, no symptoms of TB, therefore latent. And obviously there's a bunch of things that, that in terms of subclinical, for example, TB in the middle of that. Um, but also it's always, even before we rediscovered if you want subclinical TB, it's always been a bad idea. I mean, we always knew that people can clear their disease, but obviously will remain IGRA positive. And as you said, the vast majority of people who are on that spot never develop active disease, suggesting it is gone. You know, it's not latent; it's, it's cleared. <laughs> it's just you've got just the immunological marker of you know of cell mediated immunity remaining. It's yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's about as useful as a CMV IgG. You know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> nicely put. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, yeah, probably only makes sense to other ID people on the call. But yeah, really, it's just a marker that you were infected once, and it's not even sufficiently sensitive, you know, to, to really, you know, yeah. even plenty of people who have immunological failure who can also be IGRA negative or TST negative. We've all seen cases of TB in people who are IGRA negative. So, um, and it's just not sufficiently predictive um, of who's going to go on to develop TB. That's the major problem is that the vast majority of people who are IGRA or TST positive never go on to develop TB. So they're in one of those other categories that we described. Most of them probably just resolved, as you said. Yeah, that's. Thank you so much. Uh, really, we're going to end it there just because we, we're out of time, and I know you got to go as well. But thank you so much. It's really brilliant talk, and we, I'm sure it'll. Uh, we have lots of uh, requests for the for the video version on, on YouTube once we paste it. So thank you very much, Rupin. Have a good Bye, day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. See you soon.